Jen and Martin tonight after a big blast of wintry weather trying to get around Toronto days later still is not easy for some it's downright dangerous. It's just kind of crappy and it's demoralizing. The city says snow clearing can take up to 72 hours. Advocates say we need to do better. It's shocking. In the last six months we are hearing these kind, kinds of incidents a lot which is which is very concerning. Halton police are trying to reassure the community they're safe after a series of carjackings and a break in where a homeowner claims he shot an intruder in self defense. A public meeting is now set for next week. I don't know if we'll ever know to tell you the honest truth. It feels like it has gone very cold and it's been over five years. It remains one of the most talked about unsolved murders. A new podcast digs deep into what happened to Barry and Honey Sherman, the latest theories, and whether we'll ever see an arrest. This is CBC Saturday News. Those stories in a moment, but we begin with some breaking news for you tonight. We're live in Scarborough, where one person is dead after a fire at a residential high rise. You can see a number of emergency crews still on the scene. A number of residents had to be rescued by Toronto Fire and were transferred to hospital by paramedics. The fire chief gave an update just a few moments ago. We know it's a Toronto community housing building right at the corner of Kingston and Lawrence. Now, police are asking people to to avoid the intersection, you can see a lot of vehicles still there. The fire is out, but the investigation well underway. In the meantime, you can visit cbc.ca slash Toronto for more information. Our web team will keep you up to date with all the developing news. Well, to some other news we're tracking tonight, that big blast of wintry weather southern Ontario saw this week is still being cleaned up. It left behind a lot of snow, many sidewalks across Toronto still packed, making it a real challenge to get around, even dangerous for some. As Tyler Chi shows us, some advocates say the city needs to work faster. It's just kind of crappy and it's demoralizing. Russell Winkler dreads storms like the one that hit Toronto three days ago. It's kind of okay being inside for a day or two before it really gets to you. It takes a toll on mental health for, for everyone who's affected by physical barriers. Winkler says when the sidewalks aren't properly cleared, he can get stuck. Sometimes he has to drive on the street with traffic. That's why he and other accessibility advocates are calling on the city to make sure sidewalks are cleared faster. Someone I knew a number of years ago got out of a taxi one night and the taxi left and they weren't able to make it into their house and they passed away in the cold that night. So it's not just inaccessible, it's life endangering at times. And it's not just an accessibility issue. Uncleared sidewalks affect all kinds of people all over the city. We have a stroller, but it's not very great for pushing through the snow, uh, especially in a lot of these uh, smaller streets and laneways. So we take the wagon because it's got the big wheels. The city tells us it takes about 12 hours to do a single clearing of most of its sidewalks and most snowfalls require two passes. But for more severe storms like the one earlier this week, it could take up to 72 hours. But advocates say 72 hours can be a matter of life and death for those who need medications, food or support. We need to make sure that older people and people with disabilities remain safe. And that means we need sidewalks to be removed of snow, ice and debris as soon as possible. And that means the same day not three days later. The city says it uses mechanical plows to clear about 95% of Toronto sidewalks within that three day period. But Winkler wants other city residents to do what they can to help out. Shovel your sidewalk. <laughs> I live on a side street and if 10 neighbors shovel and the 11th one doesn't, the other 10 people's work didn't really help. In Toronto, home and business owners are required to clear any snowfall less than two centimeters within 24 hours. Tyler Cheese, CBC News, Toronto. Amid the cold snap, warming centers remain open in Toronto. The city says doors at the four warming centers will stay open all weekend long. The indoor spaces also offer, offer snacks and washroom facilities to people experiencing homelessness. All warming centers are available by walk-in.
Sophia joins us now with our first look at the forecast. And I feel like we're getting all of our winter weather here right at the end of the season. Yeah, just when we're ready for spring to come in, we got another thing coming. And uh, spoiler alert, how would you like another messy system looming as this storm parade really marches on? First, you talked a little bit about the cold. We're a little bit below seasonal into the evening hours, close to the minus double digits when you layer on the wind chill. And then we were talking a little bit about the snowiest day of winter so far. We were right with a really messy Wednesday into Thursday, weren't we? Nearly 18 centimeters. Uh, some areas around the GTA got closer to 20. And then we talk about all of the ice accumulation, the power outages, the hundreds of thousands without power, uh, the school closures, the many, many millimeters of freezing rain buildup. This is a scene from Essex County in Elmer area in southwestern Ontario one of the hardest hit regions. Now this is not going to be welcome news for many of the people already cleaning up, but there is another big significant Colorado low waiting in the wings that will again bring another swath of snow, freezing rain, ice pellets, and this time though a sister system will have more of a change over to rain in behind. But this will be a Monday into Tuesday story. It's still too early to pin down real accumulations and transition points, but I'll talk about that a little bit more in the long range. Until then, enjoy a relatively calm next 24 hours. Little bit of lake effect, snow, and seasonal temperatures for your Sunday, Shannon. Bit of a mess coming, okay. Thanks, Sophia. We'll mm, see Monday. you shortly. The city of Mississauga is getting ready for summer, hosting a job fair to fill thousands of part-time positions, something it lacked this past summer. We, we've had a real challenge since the pandemic um, in recruiting staff, specifically in aquatics, uh, so our lifeguards and our swim instructors, as well as our camp programming, um, which has hampered our ability to meet the demand from our community. Jobs are open to people of all ages with on-the-spot interviews. As you heard there, there is a need for certified lifeguards. Last summer, the province saw lifeguard shortages, which led to some pool closures and cancelled swimming lessons. To Milton next, a town that's been making headlines for violent carjackings and a break-in where a homeowner opened fire on an intruder. Police and at least one local politician are reassuring residents the community is safe. Ryan Patrick Jones takes us there. This violent carjacking last week caught on camera left the woman behind the wheel injured. Police say the thieves had already been on a crime spree in another stolen vehicle, involving two hit and runs and driving through a schoolyard where children were playing. Two Brampton men have been identified as suspects. Just days before, police say a 22-year-old man who lives in this home shot and killed an intruder trying to break in. Two men were arrested and three suspects remain at large. It's shocking. Um, you know, I know we're a growing community. Um, but to have something like that happen is uh, very uh, disheartening. Some residents say they're concerned by several recent high-profile crimes. In September, a well-respected auto shop owner was murdered by a former employee, leaving the community devastated. I've been living here since four years, but we never heard any such incidences for, uh, for a few years. But like, I would say within the last six months, we are hearing these kind, kinds of incidents a lot, which is, which is very concerning. The Halton Regional Police Service sought to reassure the public this week, saying while it may feel otherwise, crimes like these are rare, and Halton remains the safest large regional municipality in Canada. The murder is like behind my house, and it was sad to happen, but still, Milton is a safe place. Things happen, but not that often in Milton. You know, I get emails, phone calls, messages from... This local councillor says crime trends in Milton aren't unique. It's across the GTA, it's across the country where we're seeing increased levels of violence, increased levels of car thefts, uh, home invasions, break and enters, and, and that's concerning for residents. Kalki says vehicle thefts are a top concern for residents. Auto thefts in the region are on the rise with more than 300 vehicles stolen in Milton last year. Kalki and another councillor are hosting a public meeting next week to address those concerns. I encourage everyone to attend this meeting because that's the more people we have aware of what's going on in our community and what the police are doing, they can spread that word. Our goal is to fill the room. The meeting is set for Saturday. Ryan Patrick Jones, CBC News, Milton. 
Victims of the earthquakes in Turkey and Syria being honored today at a vigil in Toronto. These people are trying to survive. They need help. They need support. People gathering at Nathan Phillips Square to lay flowers and hold a moment of silence to recognize those who lost their lives. Organizers say it's an opportunity for community to come together and support those affected. 50,000 people died. That number is still expected to climb. Well, meantime, officials in Turkey say nearly 200 people have now been arrested in a post-earthquake investigation of possible substandard building construction. 160,000 buildings either collapsed or were severely damaged. They house more than half a million units. There is widespread suspicion many were poorly built and fell more easily. Those arrested include contractors, property owners, and people who made building alterations. Officials say more than 600 people have been investigated so far. Meantime, voters in Nigeria are in the process of electing a new president and a new parliament. As Isil Musa shows us, the stakes are high. It's being touted as Nigeria's most critical presidential election since the end of military rule in 1999. I'm eager to vote, to cast my votes, to perform my constitutional rights. So many people came out, like, they want to take back their country. But some of that excitement turned to frustration on Saturday as millions of voters waited to cast their ballots hours after polls closed. People were ready to vote, and then when you come, they cannot vote. So it's highly disappointed because what we expect is not what we are experiencing now. Officials say despite the long delays, people will get their chance to vote. There is hope a new leader in Nigeria will usher in better times. Cash and fuel shortages, unprecedented insecurity and surging inflation has left many struggling and others leaving to find opportunities abroad. These are extremely educated young people, some of them with three, four degrees who have been unemployed. Some of these youth have been have graduated for up to 10 years and have never worked. Three candidates appear to be the front runners to succeed President Mohamedou Buhari. Bola Tinubu and Etiku Abubakar represent the two main parties, while Peter Obi is seen by many as the anti-establishment candidate backed by younger voters. And for them, this is an election that presents an opportunity for Nigeria to take a new turn. Experts also say a successful democratic transition will help return Nigeria to its leadership position on the continent. Idil Musa, CBC News, Toronto. New Year's celebrations continue around the province. Members of the community gathering today in Etobicoke to celebrate the holiday and honor traditions. We're celebrating is to keep our culture and tradition uh, uh, as well as uh, to making sure that our young, young star, uh, younger generation in Canada also learn and understand and keep up with our culture and traditions. As you can see, the event featuring music, dance performances, and lots of food, too. The Tibetan New Year changes every year. This year's festival was from February 21st to February 23rd. This year is the year of the water hare. In the winter of 2017, the bodies of billionaire couple Honey and Barry Sherman were discovered, seated side by side, killed in their own home. The deaths made international news and shocked a community. Soon there were multiple theories as to what happened, even some involving members of their own family. That's a clip promoting the new CBC podcast about billionaires Barry and Honey Sherman. It's called The No Good, Terribly Kind, Wonderful Lives and Tragic Deaths of Barry and Honey Sherman. The eight-part series unveils new theories about their murders and the case, which has now gone cold. This story has captivated Canadians for five years. There are many reasons for that. Let's bring in Kathleen Goldhar. She's the host of the podcast, which just premiered this week. Thank you so much for being here with us. It's my pleasure. Kathleen, let's just start with why did you want to tell this story? 
Uh, so many reasons. As you said, I mean, it's captivated our attention for the past five years. Um, lots of reasons. I'm a born, bred Torontonian. I am part of the Jewish community, which they were part of as well. But also, it's a story that just has so many places to go. And I'm a podcaster and a journalist. And these kind of stories are what I feel like we should be talking about. Yes. And having the space to do a deep dive on it. As the title suggests, you know, these are two very complicated people. Some say Barry and Honey Sherman were terribly kind. Others say, you know, they were no good. Over this process of the year that you were doing this, what caught you by surprise? I mean, lots of things. It was really interesting for me to get to know this couple as best we could. You know, of course, I knew who they were, but after you spend over a year looking into who they were, you find out all these other things about them. And just like all of us, they were complicated, um, but they were so influential and so important in the city. You know, we found out, uh, you know, that Barry was what I'm now deeming sort of an aggressive atheist. He had no faith, no religion, no sense of God. And he really had trouble understanding um, what he deemed as rational, intellectual people having any kind of faith. So that was very interesting to know. Um, we got to learn that Barry was very, very focused on business. And in my opinion, you know, at, to a detriment to his family. Um, we also learned that Honey was motivated, her philanthropy was, she was famous uh, for her philanthropic work in Toronto and in Canada. Um, and what I learned was that it was motivated by her own background. She was born in a displaced persons camp in Austria. Her parents were Holocaust survivors. And that made sense. A lot of her focus was on Jewish causes. And it was interesting to know where that came from. There are so many theories and people speculate about this one and we've heard all sorts of things. Is there one that stands out to you now after doing this work? Not one that stands out. Uh, really what I've come to realize after all this time is that um, I don't know if we'll ever know, to tell you the honest truth. It feels like it has gone very cold and it's been over five years and every single theory that is out there has holes in it. Right. And so I, I think for me more, it's just that you know, I, I'm not that much closer to having a sense of what happened than we were five years ago. Yeah, it's it's puzzling on so many levels. And that was going to be my next question. But I think you gave us a bit of a hint. I was going to say, you know, do you have any faith that we'll see an arrest? I don't. There's only one police officer in Toronto on it. I don't know how much work is being done. There's now a $35 million reward if that's not going to bring somebody forward. I don't know what is. The family had hired a uh, team of investigators that did a shadow investigation of the police's work, and that still hasn't come up with anything. So, I mean, in my heart, I don't actually think we're going to find any kind of answers to this. Wow. Very quickly, before we let you go, I did want to ask about the family. Did you talk to them? Were they involved in the podcast? We had hoped to, but they turned us down. Uh, we do speak to some members of the family, but not direct members of the family, unfortunately. But we'd love to if they, st if they ever wanted to, for sure. Right. Well, we know you spent a year doing this. There's eight episodes. Kathleen, thank you so much for joining us and sharing it with us. I'm sure a lot of people will be tuning in. Thank you very much for having me. That's Kathleen Goldhar. And into shallow center field, and now another opportunity for Smith and Jigba. His throw is off the mark, however. And another run scores. A sunny start to spring training for our Toronto Blue Jays. The boys of summer winning a preseason game 9-7 to against the Pittsburgh Pirates in Florida this afternoon. Vlad Guerrero Jr. was among three Jays to score a home run. Toronto out hit Pittsburgh 13 to 7. It's time for a short break, but when we come back, Sophia is here with your full forecast, and it sounds like a messy one. A longtime winter tradition in Ottawa is slipping away. For the first time in 52 years, the Rideau Canal is not opening this winter due to warm weather. The news, a big disappointment for so many. Hopefully we get a better winter next year because this is one of my favorite things about living in Ottawa. It's um, something that I think most people look forward to even if you uh, only get out once a season. It's fun to do to uh, almost like tradition get a beaver tail and a hot chocolate and 
to go for a skate. This is my last year in Ottawa. Like, I go to school here. So that was, like, the one thing I was really looking forward to was the canal opening again and, like, skating. Last winter, the canal opened in mid-January. Until now, the shortest skating season on the canal was in 2016 when the skateway was open for just 18 days. The latest opening date was back in February 2002. Well, it's not quite swimsuit weather, but that didn't stop a few brave souls from participating in a polar plunge in Lake Ontario this morning. It's uh, definitely cold, but worth the, worth the effort. We are definitely freezing for a reason today. Freezing for a reason, I love that. That's Toronto Police Chief Myron Demke, one of many taking a dip there. Captain America 2, the annual plunge, is in support of Special Olympics Ontario and is the first one in person since the start of the pandemic. All of the money raised will help 26,000 registered Special Olympics athletes. More than $65,000 has already been raised. It's all for a good cause, and here's the queen of the cold plunge wow. herself. You know, I'm a fan of the cold plunge and the hydrotherapy. Yes. That was a big crowd out there. Good a for all crowd. of them. Yes, people after the show need to go on your Instagram and watch you do the yeah. cold plunge because she's just it. done one. And she put yeah. up video. Very intense. Three minutes I submerged, <laughs> oh. so I still had to build up that tolerance. Three Luckily. minutes is an eternity. <laughs> it seemed longer, I think, <laughs> when I was in there. Luckily, though, if you want to head out and follow suit after you see that video and get into Lake Ontario maybe for a quick dip. The temperature's really perfect for a cold plunge, but first you have to worry about cleaning off all of the ice and snow that we had earlier this week in exercise and futility. Our uh, storm hunter said as he posted up this video, a lot of ice we had out there and a lot of snow. So the cleanup carries on and then this is my unwelcome news is that another big system is waiting in the wings. It's that Colorado low Shannon that actually brought the historic blizzard like conditions and snow to the LA region and in California this past week and that same storm energy will be coming up to visit us Monday into Tuesday. So here's how it breaks down. Monday morning commute, okay. Monday evening commute is when things start to get a little bit hairy. There's that swath of snow, freezing rain, ice pellets, and rain though, which that switch over to rain into the overnight into Tuesday will make things a little bit easier on the cleanup when you wake up Tuesday morning. But the Monday evening commute will be hairy and a lot more snow up into eastern Ontario as well. 15 to 20 centimeters for those to the Ooh. east. Everybody else maybe about 5 to 10 centimeters. It doesn't stop. There you no, go. One <laughs> after the other. We get mild, though, after this system, which is nice. Okay, good. We'll take it. Thanks, Sophia. We'll see you tomorrow. That's our show for you tonight. Thanks for watching. We'll see you again soon.